access to this webinar is for educational and informational purposes only. Consult a licensed broker or registered investment advisor before placing any claims. All securities and orders discussed to track and monitored in virtual trading accounts. Virtual account prices and returns may differ from actual trading results. Permission costs are excluded. Neither Phil Stockwell's.com, CSW, nor its affiliates, nor any of the respective offices. Personnel, representatives, agents, or independent contractors are in such capacities licensed financial advisors, registered investment advisors, and registered broker dealers. Nothing contained in this webinar, website, or promotional material constitutes a promotion, recommendation, solicitation, or offer of any particular investment, security, or transaction. Trading options involve risk. Visit the OCC website www.optionsclearing.com for these characteristics and risks of standardized options. PSW provides education and training services that are meant to teach you to the risks and potential rewards of trading options, and we are not a service that tells you what to trade. We are not implying a guarantee of any profit. As always, do not trade with money that you cannot afford to lose. Past performance does not equal future results, and results discussed in this webinar are not typical and are only valid on the specific or identified day. Your results may vary. By accessing this webinar, you agree to hold the advance harmless from any loss that you may incur as a result of information discussed in the media identified above. By accessing this webinar, you agree to be placed on our mailing list and receive our newsletter. Rest assured, we take your privacy very seriously and we will not distribute or spread your information to anyone. All right, sounds good. <clears throat> All right, let's see how things are looking. We got. Uh, let's look at the bigger chart. All right, everybody's struggling to get green, except the NASDAQ is uh, doing very well at 035, though not as good as it was before. The Russell's right on the line. The S&P's right on the line. The Dow is just a bit below the line. Nothing shocking so far. Um, Oil had a nice dip after that inventory report. It really fell off a cliff. And we'll go take a look at the um, detailed report first off to see if we should make a trade on it. Gasoline fell down right to this S1 line. I'm, I'm sorry, S2. And um, interestingly, though, oil completely crashed through their line. They, they've got no support whatsoever. So this is not a good sign. I'm not quite sure what happened besides we have a dollar got stronger. The oil report showed a big bill, which was very disappointing to them. And um, other than that, well, I don't really know a specific reason this happened. The strong dollar is knocking down, uh, is knocking down gold and silver. Uh, coffee had a nice pop, though. We made some money on that one. And um, the Nikkei is where it is. The Nikkei is oddly not really doing well, considering how strong the dollar is. And uh, natural gas doesn't care about anything. Natural gas is just flying back up to that $3 line up here. And we'll see what happens. <clears throat> Uh, oh, I was going to show you that. Let's see. I still have that same Dow trade from last week. Um, that's, I think I have 20 at the moment. Yeah, it's 20 now. Um, <laughs> it's been a hell of a day. I, I, I wish I had taken the money here at 28. This was greedy because we hit 850-ish, or not 850, but we hit 870, which was a really nice game. This was like... Um, uh, 10, almost $10,000 ago. <laughs> oh, wait a second. Wait, wait, wait. 20 times 5 is $1,000 per uh, 10 points. So, yeah. So, this was $10,000 ago. I'm sort of like in it for the long haul. You know, like I'm waiting for the great big crash. I do go up and down 10. So, I, only, I actually only added this. I added 10 more when it was up here this morning. So, that's why there's a $7,000 profit on the position now. But even so, I, last night, had I just taken that off and waited and come back in, I would have done much, much better. And that's what I think, because, you know, we were, we were talking about that in the chat. And I'm thinking, you know, with this trade like this, look at this range. The here, if I, just, if I just get short here, and that's 950, it's the same 2950 we started the trade at. If I got short here at 950, if I took my profit at 9, wait for it to get back to 950, look how many times we could have made this trade. Um, ba, 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 ba. chart flexible grade. There you go. <clears throat> Let's say YM. See, this is the thing because people fall too in love with their trade. Uh, 15 minutes should do it. Yeah, maybe there you go. Okay, <clears throat> so here we were at last week's webinar, right? When we started this thing and it went up to 21, and I was insistently short. 
Now, so here's the here's the 20950 line is way up here. That's when it settled down. Before it settled down, we were using the 211 line. But once it went down to 950, the point being though that I could have used the 21 line, I could have used the 950 line. But the point was, rather than sit on the stupid trade, which we, you know, we obviously we did cash this when it did that because you know that was like a lot of money. We were down, I forget, we were down like ten thousand or close more than ten thousand last week. So we took the money and got even and got out and got back in. But when we got back in, the point being that we were just in this sort of rangy, bouncy sort of thing, and instead of just holding on to the trade, which is mostly what we've been doing, or what I've been doing anyway. It would have been better off. See, look at all these opportunities at 209.50. Here and down, here and down, here and down, here and down, down and down and down, back up to uh, here, 950, and down again. So could have gotten in and out of the trade and made $250 per contract five, six, seven times. And on 10 contracts, that's 2500 per contract. So you're talking about you know ten thousand, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars instead of, and I had twenty at one point, but so I easily, easily could have made like ten or fifteen thousand dollars instead of seven thousand dollars. I'm just being stubborn, and I keep the, the mostly the ten short going down, and now my basis is almost twenty one, twenty one hundred. But it's been a, it's just been a long, hard struggle, and honestly, not worth it. So better off taking the money and running. He says as he watches his. Uh, this thing pop back up. But yeah, so, so basically if the NASDAQ comes through this line, I'm going to start losing confidence and I'm going to want to lighten back up on these. I'm still going to keep the 10 though. I'm doggedly determined to keep this 10 until somebody pays me like $40,000. That's basically my goal. So I'm pretty confident the Dow is going to, going to crash at some point. I just have no idea when. But until then, I'm just going to keep rolling my short position. <clears throat> we did copy earlier. That's uh, how much is that now? 13. 50. So two contracts of copy. We picked it up down here this morning. That jumped up to 1350 already on two contracts. So that's a nice gain for the day. And again, we're talking about that now. Uh, 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 Bourbon, I think, is asking in chat, like, why do you sometimes keep it? Like, why would I ride this one down and never and never sell it? And why this one do I do I jump right back out? And again, it's actually smarter to jump back out when you get a good run. You have to look in the context of look. That's a big run for coffee. That's a big run for coffee. That's a big run. It always goes down, and then it goes up, and then it goes down, and then it goes up. So it went down, and then it went up, and I caught it. End of story. There's no reason to stay in this trade. I know 145 is going to get rejected. I know that there's going to be a, you know, at least a, you know, it did right here, in fact. This is what it got up to. You know 145 is going to be rejected. So the question is, do I really think this is the one that's going to break over 145? And, and frankly, yes, I do. That's why I'm still in it. I think this is it'd be a nice bounce. But you can't ever be sure of those things. I can be sure he's breaking over and now the S&P is making a nasty move and I'm very worried about my Dow position. So yeah, I just lost 500 bucks while we were talking about it. Ah, that's it, I'm done. All right, bye. Oh. <laughs> Ran away. All right, bye. Bye, is anybody gonna fill? Bye. Only doing one at a time. Bye. Bye. Oh, come on. Really? Annoying. Painful load. Try it again. Now you come down to where I canceled. Great. Bye. 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 And. Now I can get greedy selling his quote. Yeah. Okay. All right. Come on. <clears throat> I guess I'm kind of anal retentive about that. Like I want my whole numbers. <laughs> so, it's like I, don't, I really want to sell for 20. I don't want to sell for 21. It annoys me. Ah, look at it. All right. See, now it, it jumped up, but I should be happy because I got rid of most of them below that, way below that line. But you see, I could see that was going to happen because I could see him breaking over a significant resistance line. I can see him popping up, and the Dow's only a matter of time before it's going to go too. All right, so we're done with that. Now I have 10 again. 
Now understand, I'm going to take a loss. I know I'm going to take a loss. I'm going to go up here, and it's going to be loss. So I'm going to go back to 20 again. I wanted to. I wanted to go up here. Now I want to have 20. I don't want to have 10. I want to have a big fat down position. And to do that, it's got to go up. I can't have a big fat down position because look. Now these guys, my average was not what's to say 963. Okay, which is. Um, Basically, right up, right up here where this red line is. So that's my average, and uh, I'm now I'm going to enter. Now I'm going to re-enter that position. So I took a little profit here, not huge, not, nothing like what I would have gotten if I would have swung and cashed out here. But I took a nice profit here. I've got this cushion now. If it does sort of drop, okay, I won't make as much, but at least I did the smart thing. But you got to take profits off the table when you have them. If you're not going to, if you're not going to take profits off the table. When are you going to make a profit? You've got to learn to take your profit. <clears throat> if you're buying and selling quick, why play longer term futures? Because I intend, I, I intend to be in coffee long term. I would be much happier if coffee slowly and steadily went up. It's been the series of coffee. It's not realistic uh, because that's not how it works. Um, but you never know. So here's the thing. All right. Let's say it goes against me. So here's coffee over the last year, okay? So what I'm hoping for is something a little more like this. So in March was a spike. You can't help. See, now in March, I would have gotten out. I would have taken that money and rent because that's, you know, a huge move off 130 to 150. Okay, 20 cents in coffee is a lot of money. I can't even remember. I don't know how much, but obviously... Five cents was like thirteen. Five cents was seven fifty. So figure it out. Um, so anyway, so that would be that's a, a nice move. And see, and again, a nice move, and then it stops. A nice move. So a nice move in coffee is two boxes. Is twenty cents. That's a nice move in coffee. It's twenty cents. Two boxes. Two boxes. Two boxes. Three box move here. So it's four to two boxes. Okay. Here's a four box drop. And then a two box move up. So obviously a two box move in coffee, if you don't take it off the table, you're being completely unrealistic. All right, now today we had nothing. Today was a nothing move. This is not even a, a bit of a box. So long term, I want it. Now here's the trick. When I buy it at 141, I know it's you know, and this is the thing, like a lot of people on the site don't get this concept of getting in. I don't know that that's the bottom, and frankly, I'm only, if I'm only buying a couple of contracts, I don't want it to be the bottom. I want this to happen. I want to be buying here and then buying more here, and then that won't make me satisfied. Then I'll buy more here. Then it goes up and I cut back to half. Then it goes down and I double down again, and then I sit on the thing because I have a wonderful, I have a nice big position and good basis. But if I'm in with only a couple of contracts and it makes a quick profit, I, I, I'm realistic about like saying, let's just take that quick profit off the table and wait and see what happens. Doesn't hurt you to take a profit. Um, let's say, for example, okay, let's say I have a ski house, which I do. Um, <clears throat> so I've got I've got a, I've got a place in Tahoe, and it's uh, um, it rents for mm, about five hundred dollars a night when I rent it. Okay, it doesn't always have renters in it. There's no guarantee. I say, I say maybe um, over the course of the ski season, which is 100 nights, I'd say 50, probably, yeah, about, it makes about 20,000 bucks. So I'd say it rents 40% it rents of the time. So, you know, 40%, so 40% I, I'm sorry, no, I actually rents a lot more than that. I'm wrong, because I forget the rental company takes the money, too. Uh, they take half the money. So it actually rents 80% of the time, and I get 40% of the money. Um, hmm. Man, what a scam those rental companies are. Anyway, all right, moving on. Um, so now that, now that we know we should own the rental company and not the condo itself, um, but, but silly me, I own the condo. So it rents, for, uh, not for, it rents for $500 a night, and it rents 80% of the time during the winter season. Um, so I know that I'm going to get – now – Forget the management company, but I, I know that you know, ignoring the management company, so I know I'm getting five hundred dollars from my condo every time I rent it, right? I also know it rents eighty percent of the time. Now, if somebody comes to me and says, 
I'm going to give you a thousand. I'll give you fifteen hundred dollars a day for two days. But they're the two weekend days when I usually can rent out, and usually I can rent out for a week. I have to balance out the certainty of getting my fifteen hundred, uh, getting three thousand dollars from them for two days, versus if I went a week, I would get thirty five hundred dollars, right? But I don't know for sure. I'm gonna, I only have an eighty percent certainty I'm going to rent the week out. Whereas this guy's standing there ready to give me three thousand dollars for two days. So I take the money because I made the money faster, and maybe, maybe, I might rent out those loose days. You never know. And it's no, it's no different here, okay? If you make a quick profit, even though you plan on making a bigger profit, if you make a quick profit right away, take it off the table, and, it's, and if that's the end of the trade, you know what? If I, if I made a, a couple of thousand dollars here, I took it off the table, and then it ran up on me, and it kept going up, and I never played it again, I'd be like, fine, I'll take my $2,000 and put it into something else. I don't have to play coffee. I don't have to play oil. I don't have to play anything. I play whatever is a good air. Look, I play whatever looks interesting. These are all my futures. Any one of these I can play any time. Oh, look at sugar. See, sugar is interesting. Why is sugar so cheap? Okay, I know why sugar's cheap. Sugar's cheap because uh, people are taxing soda, and uh, the soda companies are cutting back on, on sweeteners, and everybody's on a no-sugar kick. So I would not buy sugar. And it's even causing a cocoa shortage. Oh, I mean, sorry, cocoa surplus because nobody's eating chocolate either. So see, poor cocoa and poor sugar are both having big problems. Now, um, sugar is, I'm sorry, cocoa 1,925 is down 6 uh, 6 inch, 25 percent. Is sugar down 25 percent? Sugar is down from 21, and they're not 100 percent equal, but, but conceptually, sugar is down from 21 to 1850, which is uh, uh, 250, which is 10 percent. So sugar is nowhere near down as far as coffee. That means I don't have a lot of confidence in calling a bottom on sugar, even though it looks nice and attractive. But if sugar starts going up, then cocoa becomes interesting. Because I got to figure if people are starting to use sugar again, then cocoa might come back and go off. All right, coffee. Coffee, we know. Now, coffee, we know the story. In fact, we just yesterday went over the coffee report. Ooh, let's do that since people are interested. I know I'm interested. Uh, coffee report yesterday. And we can go control F. And we can say. Uh, Robusta, because where else would they talk about Robusta except in a coffee report? Okay. <laughs> so that was easy to find. <clears throat> so um, so the coffee report yesterday, I said, see, I said KCN7 is a good deal at 143.25. That's July and April contract for 141. So 225, blah, 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 blah. Now, what do we say it is right now? It's at 144. All right, so yesterday we were liking it. Oh, I've got to get out of this thing. Four and four. Yeah, what do you think? Oh, it closes. It, it, I thought it closed with a one o'clock. That's interesting. Huh. Anyway, let's get out of these. Again, it's a lot of money. It's, uh, well, now it's only 1200 bucks. It was 1400 bucks. So it's 1200 bucks. Boom, when we're done. All right, so now we'll see what happens tomorrow. Um, where was it? Oh, yeah, right. We're looking at the contract. So, yesterday I said, I like that because the April contracts are 141. And you're only paying 2.25 cents more for the July contract. So, you have three more months to 2.25 cents, or $2.25, sorry. And I highlighted the good stuff in the report. So, evidence is that the developing coffee markets in Asia, oh, wait, I can do this uh, control bigger. Zoom, zoom, zoom. There you go. All right. <clears throat> Evidence of the developing coffee markets in Asia are maintaining steady growth and uh, with the large population of Indian, Pakistan, Vietnamese, Philippine markets continue to support rising. All right, so big countries. All right, now, by the way, when I read this, and, by, and, and you know, I used to look this up. Okay, I don't look this up now because I know it, but I used to look this up. India, 1.3 billion people. Indonesia, 
uh, you know, 500 million people, Vietnam, a couple hundred million people, Philippines, uh, 100 million people, 50 million people, something like that. So if you're talking about like a good 1.5 billion people here are drinking more coffee. Okay, that's a lot of coffee. So one of the reasons is because of these simple systems like the carriage and things like that, and it, it, you know, even in limited circumstances, as long as you can get water, all you need is water and a container for the coffee. And I know coffee's not that complicated anyway, but in all these different places, disposable coffee and things like that, that give you uh, uh, that fresh brewed taste, people like that. It's, you know, people are well to do, the middle classes of these countries. They love the convenience of these systems. And, 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 and by the way, it doesn't make character good by because there's a million people who do it now. But um, it's very popular, and a lot of the cafes have it, so they use it. And um, there's all these different brewing systems, and there's, of course, Starbucks and all the different kinds of coffee companies and all that. Everywhere in the world, it's economically, it's a pretty good business. In fact, when we were doing the numbers on the Times Square Starbucks, and they're doing like $3 million in that location. You know, and they've got four of them. It's not just one. They've got three. They've got four of them at each corner of Times Square, and they're, and they're all doing about $3 million worth of business. So you think about the massive numbers that they're pulling in from, like, a location like that. And then you think about a, a guy in Vietnam with his little Starbucks or whatever he wants to call it. All he has to do there, you know, he's, he's covering, like, a $500 a month rent. So he needs, he needs $500 a month, and he needs water to make the coffee with and some cream from the supermarket, and he's all set. That's his business. That is a good little business to open up anywhere in the world, little coffee shops. Um, anyway, so it's all being encouraged, and people like it, and it's a cheap form of a drug. Caffeine's a drug. It's a cheap way to get a little drug kick in the morning. Everybody likes that. Uh, and, and in all these developing markets, it's the kind of thing that, that's doing well. People have gotten um, really into the coffee thing all over. So the growth in consumption is being matched by consumer market growth in developing markets, and the Middle East and Turkey are looking at an increase in demand and blah, blah, blah. You need to have huge, you know, demand trends that just aren't stopping. That's the key to this thing, all right? Supply is kind of flat. And then it says, the, the, the interesting thing is the report says, with adverse weather conditions aside, the adverse condition, weather conditions are what we're betting on. With betting on global warming screwing up the coffee supply, it's likely to assist to encourage increased supply from the new coffee planting. So in other words, they're planting more coffee. But they're saying adverse weather conditions aside, it should balance out. I'm saying, no, you can't put aside adverse weather conditions. The weather is freaking insane. I mean, most of you guys live in places where it's like it snows and then it's 70 degrees the next day. This is not normal. And it's not good for crops. Okay, if we start having, if we have weather, like, if we have weather in the summer, like we're having in the winter, where all of a sudden it's freezing, you know how orange crops get decimated by cold, right? A lot of these fruit crops, if it freezes, they die. So if we have days in the summer, but, you know, like the way we have a 70-degree day in the middle of the winter, if we have a 30-degree day in the middle of the summer, that is not going to be good. Anyway, all right, so, but long term, just a general warning trend of the planet is not good for crops. On the short term, however, the forecast for yet another dismal, another dismal column, I don't even know what that means, robusta crop for Brazil. And uh, uh, so, so blah, blah, blah. Both crops in Brazil are going to be bad. Vietnam is tighter because they have a lower crop too, which I was talking about the other day. I was saying anything north of the equator is going to be a problem. I think I was talking on TV about that. And uh, it was supportive of you for a more positive coffee outlook over the coming months. Then it says, however, with good volumes of crops from Vietnam, Central America, and Colombia still coming to the market, the funds have been cautious about getting into the coffee. Therefore, they, they don't, nobody knows what's going on because the weather's changing. Nobody models the weather changing. Everybody assumes, everybody assumes weather is a thing that's kind of random but constant. Okay, so in other words, in all the modeling, when you're doing modeling for, for you know, uh, commodities and such, you're going to take into account you take into account the seasonality, but not really the weather. You just assume weather sometimes is good, sometimes is bad. There's nothing you can do about it. We're saying no, this is different because now the weather is getting bad, and it's getting badder 
on a pretty annual, rapid basis. Global warming is a constant thing that's happening every single year. It's getting worse, and we're doing nothing to fix it. So far, we as a, country, as a, as a globe have really done nothing to fix it, and, uh, and frankly, Trump is reversing a lot of the things that America was going to do to fix it, so it's not going to get better. And so what we, you know, we're into coffee for the long, long haul and expecting it to, to rise back up. And then when you look at the longer-term coffee chart, so coffee, 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 there it is. So when you look at the monthly coffee chart, look where we are. This is, this is 300. This is 400. It's been decades since we, you know, it was, it was seven years since we hit that high. And, this, and by the way, this is the invention of Keurig and one cups and things like that. This is a fad that caused a huge spike in demand for coffee, not repeated. Then what happened is a whole bunch of people started growing coffee because they're like, well, for $300, I'm going to grow a ton of coffee. Now there's too much coffee. So the, you know, the fad lasted a year or two. The fad faded out a bit. And the, unfortunately, at the same time the fad faded out, all the production came online. Oh, and not just a fad, but you have to realize, like, <clears throat> so, so they start putting coffee in these little cups, right? So now they have to fill warehouses full of little cups filled with coffee, and all the supermarkets stock their shelves with all these little cups filled with coffee. So all of a sudden, the demand for the crops is going into a storage supply of coffee that never existed before. And that's where the demand came from. Not just people physically drinking it, but the demand for the containers themselves all of a sudden caused this ramp up as people built warehouses and started stockpiling coffee to sell to the consumers. But then once they start selling it to the consumers and more and more coffee is being grown, now you've got the, the, the coffee they built up here, all the storage in the warehouse, is being sold off at the same time that more and more coffee supply comes to the market, and boom, down you go. And then it goes too far down. It goes back here, down here. You find some equilibrium eventually. And I think equilibrium is going to be around 200, 250. So anytime coffee is below the 150 line, I'm excited about buying it. Anytime. I don't care how low it goes below here. I think eventually it's going to come back up. And especially if we have a bad year. If, somebody, if, you know, if one of our major producers has a bad uh, crop season, this thing can go flying higher. So it's a fun commodity to be in. Natural gas also. I'll tell you, natural gas this year, also down in the dumps, right? This year, already now, there's a ton of tornadoes in the, in the middle of the country. Like a huge, there's many, many, many more t tornadoes than usual. Well, if there's a lot of tornadoes in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the winter and spring, then maybe there'll be a lot of hurricanes in the fall, and a lot of hurricanes has a high chance of disrupting natural gas which can cause a tremendous spike like this. This is what happens when there's a hurricane. That and that is a hurricane. That's what happens when, that, when, when hurricanes damage the production of natural gas in the Gulf. You can get a, a one box spike. A one box spike is five freaking dollars. That's like 5,000 per contract on a spike like that. So, yeah, of course, that's interesting. And, and since I think this is a good floor, this is all I care about, I think that's a good floor. I don't think I'm going to lose too much money here. Maybe it'll go to 250 and I'll be down, um, wait a minute, it's $100 a point. Wait, it's $100. Is it $100 a penny? I'm confused. All right. I'll tell you, honestly, I, I would tell you 10 contracts. I get very confused with what it is. Um, Forex Trader, NG. It is, it is a hundred dollars a penny. That's right. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So I'm sorry. So that would be, it's fifty thousand dollars if you get if you catch a five dollar move. <laughs> Seems kind of unrealistic, doesn't it? Uh, that's because usually you're not going to catch a five a five dollar move. But I like the NG. Um, is it the V7? I think it's the V7 that we've been playing. V7, and let's make that an official trade and see how it goes, okay? So we have NGV7, and those are currently, these are October, so we're into hurricane season. They're at 317 right now. 
Whereas the regular, now it's expensive because we are, we're not the only ones playing this game. The regular NGs are only 293 So we're paying a uh, 24 cent premium to be out to November, to October. That's a pretty high premium. All right, but I seriously don't believe it's going to go below three, that contract. So $3 is going to be a loss of, um, not $3, three cents. Three cents would be a loss of 300 bucks. I don't mind betting that we're going to lose 300 bucks. So let's take NGV7 now, go to Active Trader. And um, coffee we're out of. Okay, so we're done with that, even though it looks decent. I'm dying to get back in it, but I'll see what happens tomorrow. I'm not in a hurry. NGV7. I don't still have these, do I? Oops. No, nope, don't still have them. Okay. So, unfortunately, I missed, you know, we had 310. We missed that out. So, we're just going to take, take one, do I want to No. Yes. <laughs> I, can't, I can't play one. It's too boring. All right, I'll play two. Maybe. Wow, not filling it. Really, bastard. There you go. Okay. All right, so now I have two. I'm at 317.45. All right, so if it goes to 310, I'm very, very happy to add more. Okay, I wouldn't add more unless it goes to 310. Now, if it goes to 310, I'm going to be down $700 per contract. Look, I'm down $50 in two seconds. So at 310, I'll be down 700 per contract. I'll be down 1400 bucks. I'm going to add a couple more at 310. And if it goes to three, that'll get ugly as far as how much I'm down. But I would then want to get, then I want to get serious and buy a bunch. So that's where we are with that one. Meanwhile, the Dow is kind of running out of gas now, so hopefully it'll come down. All right, so that's so that's our official trade right now as we do the, the longs on natural gas. Because again, and not and it's October, and I don't really care how long it takes. I don't expect it to go up right away. I actually do expect it to go lower. If you're more patient than me, you can wait for it to hit 310, because it probably will. But if it doesn't, I'll be pissed off if I don't have some. So that's my attitude about that. All right. We're all looks good. So that. Did you ever play Coco? Yep, we talked about Coco. It looks pretty low, but God, but but there's just this trend against coffee and uh, chocolate and sugar and stuff. So you got to be careful about that. Why did you buy that? Why I'm one at a time. Mostly because that's the way it was set. I usually scale in and out, like I'll buy one here and there. I don't just like buy 10. You know, when I add them back in, I'll buy one, then I'll buy another one, then I'll buy another one as it goes down. Um, so I don't, so rather than change it to five or something like that, if I was worried it was going to get away from me, I would have put in five at a time or something like that or 10 at a time. But I'm not worried and um, I just left the setting where it was. That's why I keep the setting generally at one. So I don't. Mostly, and I like the setting of one because if I make a mistake, because I have, I, I've like clicked it three times and accidentally bought 30 contracts instead of three like I thought I would. So it's safer for me to just keep all my settings at one so I don't screw myself up. Or you know, even more, if I think I'm at one and I've got two short contracts and then I, and then I want to buy back my short contract and I go click, 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 and I buy back my short contract and I accidentally overclick and I have 10, and, I, and if I'm doing 10 instead of one, then I end up like 28 long on a position I originally wanted to be short on. <laughs> That's also very – and then then I look at my portfolio like an hour later. I'm like, what the hell? You know, looking like, what happened, to my, what happened to my money? And I realized like, I've accidentally short a whole bunch of contracts. So in general, I keep my default always at one contract because I mean, it's easier to click 10 times once in a while than to uh, make any mistakes. Take 3K and go ski. That's true, yep. Uh, sugar is the cancer of our world. <laughs> okay. I happen to like sugar. Although I'm actually drinking my nice zero-calorie green tea right now. It's my favorite thing. Love my little green teas. Now, take up to 55 pounds. Not when you're buying in the freaking store. Oh, wait. No, they probably, actually, I'm sorry. That probably is the price you mean in the store. I'm thinking like, I'm thinking like how much coffee is. Yeah, coffee is, uh, what, eight bucks a pound? Although... I just paid 
$35 for eight ounces of Jamaican Blue Mountain at Starbucks. <laughs> Which is really a really ripoff, but my, we love it. You know, we went to Jamaica on a cruise, and uh, we had we went to a plantation where they grow the stuff, and it was such good coffee. So they had a, they had a bag at the Starbucks, and my daughter was like, "Oh, please, Dad, can we get some?" She freaking loved it. So I was like, "All right." I mean, I and they're, and they're smart at Starbucks because they tag your zip code because there's nowhere else you can get that. Jamaican Blue Mountain coffee. Um, I think even if you get it in Jamaica, it's probably like twenty bucks a pound or something in Jamaica. This is this is seventy a pound though. They're charging at Starbucks. Um, I think probably my zip code is one of the only zip that uses for Montclair's in Montclair, New Jersey. Um, the Montclair Starbucks. We're like one of the few zip codes in the world that can support impulse buying of thirty-five dollar bags of coffee. <laughs> but. They they know they know their market man because people are picking it up because <laughs> you gotta find you gotta find people who have gone to Jamaica had the coffee you've been you know people who travel a lot and and drink that kind of coffee and are willing to on an impulse go oh thirty five bucks sure why not but um, it's good <laughs> I got stuff the bad habit I've had like four cups from that bag already. That's why that's why like Starbucks is a long term investment that they figure out they, they know their market. They know how to get people. And uh, and, and boy, target marketing is the most amazing thing these days though. I mean, they they really profile everybody. They know exactly what you like and what you want and where to get. And for each store, like Starbucks, you know, they've got different blends in different places. Everywhere you go, it's sort of and it's nice though because it's kind of like is it a regional thing? So instead of like every Starbucks being identical, if you go to a Starbucks in a different part of town or in a different city, they have different stuff. I just talked about you. Oh, well, we didn't talk about UNG. We talked about natural gas. So, yeah, I have a long-term love for, for natural gas, but UNG kind of sucks. Um, and let's look at it. Do we still have it in the, in the options opportunity portfolio? Let's see. Ooh, 156. We're down a bit. Oh, the new hedges aren't in here, though. I, I didn't make the hedging adjustments on here. These are still the old hedges. So we'll see how we're doing. Um, but, 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 no, see, we dumped UNG because we were dissatisfied. So that's interesting. All right, so UNG died in that portfolio. It's probably still in the long-term portfolio because we tend not to change that. Ooh, the long-term portfolio lost a couple percent, too. Not a good week. Um, there we go. So for UNG, we have the uh, 2019 $6 calls. They're, uh, we bought them for three and they're two. That sucks. We sold the $9 puts. We sold them for two and they're 280 That sucks too. So neither one of these are making any money. Now, what's sad about that is these are from December of 2016, and I'll bet coffee is up since then. Let's take a look. Coffee, daily... Um, bu, 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 bu. Where are you? Ah, so here you go. In December, right? Well, okay. So no, actually, no, it hasn't really moved. But so coffee hasn't moved, but UNG has lost his money. So I, I don't remember what date was that. That was December twenty-first. So like the end of December. Nope. So in the end of December. Which is probably right about this dip is why it's probably why we bought it in the first place. We we bought UNG. It did pop up. It's a shame we didn't take the money in Rome when it did that. But it popped up. Now it's back here. But even so, you would think that the ETF that tracks coffee would be about even, but it's not. It's actually just decayed. Oh, let's find that. Um, okay, let's normalize the size here. Control minus a couple. I like a bit of one more. Okay, there you go. Now, let's pull out. Um, that guy for charts. And then we'll look at J-O. No, I'm sorry, U-N-G. So it's U-N-G. Okay, so here's U-N-G.
Was that like in the wrong chart? So I saw my coffee. I didn't put my coffee. I was. Ah, sorry about that. Wrong one. Getting mixed up. Energy. So I'm wrong. December 21st, it was up here. Oh, okay. Well, that, well actually, that's, that's not, it's not really as bad as I was thinking because it's actually about right. Because UNG, I was looking at coffee like an idiot. UNG was 360. Now it's 280. So, yeah, we should be losing money. We, we, we called it totally wrong. We thought this dip was going to be a good one. We did get a bunch of, a punch up to four, and we didn't take the money. It fell right back down, and now it's completely collapsed. Okay, I still think it's fine. I'm not, I'm not freaking out about it, but UNG itself is a terrible ETF because it decays all the time. Let's see if I can um, separate it. There we go. Okay, a little tricky. No, 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 no. Do that. Do that. Okay. Go there, and you go there. And futures. Yes. Okay. Not the same size, but close enough. All right. So, so the time in question. We can match these up a bit. Okay. So here's the November dip. Comes back up. This is actual copy. UNG actually, UNG actually recovered better than coffee. Coffee didn't make it all the way back up here, but UNG did. Then it went down, then it went back up, and now they kind of tracked each other. Then it fell, went across, and down. But the difference is, the big difference is that um, coffee is down from $4 to $3. So that's um, 25%, right? But UNG is down from nine dollars to uh, seven dollars, which is not much more than twenty-five percent. Let's see, that's two hundred. This is two hundred nine. That's twenty-two percent. This is not making my point at all. Okay, so actually, all right, I take it back. <laughs> it doesn't decay as badly as I thought. I got to tell you, I'm doing the math now. I'm thinking, no, that's actually not so bad. It does decay over time, but not over the, the three-month period that we're looking at, not really. So it's not terrible. So that being said, I, as I said, I, you know, we, we haven't changed it in the long-term portfolio because our attitude is that we, we can always adjust it. It's a, a big position. It's $14,200 in the long-term portfolio. Um, I was waiting for it to go up so we could sell calls against it, and we're not getting that. Um, we have two years, though, so it's not really like an emergency. I'm very comfortable with this $9 target on the put. So that means, you know, this loss of $8,000 will be erased. And and right now we're negative 5, you know, we're minus 5,000 here. If we get this 8,000 back, this will be plus in the end anyway, and then anything above um, 7 bucks will be a bonus. So it's not a, it's nothing to urgently run about. Um, you want to look at like whether it's worth it to roll to the fives or do something with it. So we'll look at 2019, and we have the sixes. So we're going to go trade UNG. Mm -mm. So the five, all right, the sixes are 215. It says the five to two fifty, but I don't see that because the spread's two forty to four two ninety five. These guys are probably about three forty. So if that's two fifteen and these are three forty, then it's not gonna cost us a buck and a quarter to roll two dollars. It's almost worthwhile. The five, if these are let's say uh, thirty cent different no, fifty cent difference, so let's add thirty to that and call it seventy five. So if these guys are two ten and these are two seventy five, it costs us sixty five. To roll to the five. So, do I want to spend 65 cents to pick up a dollar and strike? No, it's not worth it. We're already in the money. 
So spending 65 to make another 35, that just isn't going to make it worthwhile. What we want to do is wait for a nice pop, and then depending on how much money we get for like the nine, like right now they're a buck, and maybe we'll maybe we'll sell the nines for a buck, or maybe, I mean maybe we'll get a buck fifty for the nines. Then we can take half of that money and put it into rolling down. So we'll widen the spread and go deeper in the money. But until coffee moves up, until you know, look, it's it's a commodity and it's cyclical. So it's going to go up and it's going to go down. I'm sorry, we talk about natural gas or coffee. We talk about natural gas. Uh, <laughs> But let's look at a weekly chart. Okay? It goes down, it goes up, 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 it goes down. And what's going to happen next? Probably it goes up. So right now we're sitting on a position. So all I really care about, I'm not worried about whether or not UNG, to get to get that, but I'm not worried about whether UNG gets back to nine. I don't think that's going to be difficult at all. What I'm worried about is when I want to sell the short calls. And I think we'll sell the short calls when we get at least to 350, preferably to four. Then we'll get some good money for the short calls and then we'll take advantage of the spread. But in natural gas, if we get a good hurricane, we could be up around five easy on a good hurricane. And like I said, you're talking about um, it's ten that it's it's a it's a thousand dollars per dime. So this is a ten thousand dollar move. That's a twenty thousand dollar move on these contracts. That's why I like them. Maybe there won't be a hurricane. If we're unlucky, there won't be a hurricane. There'll be no devastation. People won't lose their homes. There won't be a crisis. <laughs> that would be that would be sad. So the crisis will be we don't make any money. But if you want to make money off of other people's misery. This is a fantastic way to do it. UNG is still on the OOP. You say that, but I didn't see it. Let me see it. Oh, crazy. This is not the OOP. Um, not there. Oh, it is. I'm sorry. <laughs> my alphabet was wrong. I was looking at the bottom of it. It's a low W. All right, so UNG is still here. And we, oh, here we have 2018. These are definitely going to move. So again, though, I'm not terribly upset with my targeting here. In fact, we sold these for a fat 382. So I'm really not worried enough to roll those. On the whole, this trade's so profitable. That's because we took it at a much better time. We took this like a year ago. Um, and we took and we took the spread. See that saved us because having the spread allowed us to offset the loss on these. So here we have the five dollar calls, but they two oh eighteen, not two oh nineteen. And what do we say those calls were? Like four bucks? Damn it. Wish I had a memory. Um Oh no, no, they're only two fifty. Okay. Oh, when you guys just bought it for two fifty. Wow. While I was talking about it, somebody did two fifty. Um so those calls are two fifty. And we can get, no, that would be ridiculous. 238? Is that true? No, that's, I don't know why it says 238. The 2000, oh, that's October. Oh, oh, oh. There you go. That year wasn't even open. Oh, it is 238. Wow. Well, that's stupid then. Of course you want to roll that. I mean, there'd be no, there's no reason not to roll that. So then the question is, while you're rolling, do you want to roll lower? So, the, so then should we spend, I mean, honestly, 238 to 250 is a 15-cent roll to buy another year to make money. Now, that's offset somewhat because you're buying another year for it to decay, and there is a decay of maybe like 10%. So UNG will drop a buck over the course of the year, but still I'd rather have the time. Um, but the question is, do we want to drop a buck while we're doing it? And to drop a buck, if we go from 238 to um, like, 330, like 350, probably not 350, but three, well, let's say you can do it for 348. Let's say you can do it for 345. Now, for a dollar, I'm going to buy a year and take a dollar in position. That I kind of like. 
So I might want to look for something like that. Now, if we do that roll, though, where does that leave us? That leaves us with the short $10 calls. I got no problem with that. I think for 37, for, for 35 cents, so which probably is really 35 cents, I would buy these back. So I think I would do the roll, buy those back, and then wait for the bounce. The same way we're waiting for the bounce in the long-term portfolio. So in the yeah, so so back, so we're back to the same thing. So that's why the decision in the long-term portfolio is to hold it. There's really nothing that we need to change. And even here, there's nothing we need to change, but we could take advantage of the low price and do the roll and buy ourselves another yield. So that if I had to do something today, that's what I would do. What's going to happen though is I don't have to do anything. I'm going to just uh, next time we do an LPP, uh, an options opportunity review, which will be probably this week. Um, a winter expiration will certainly be next week because next week is expiration. Um, ooh, and I have to do it. Wow, I'm leaving Thursday for Florida. Damn it! All right, I really got to get my crack together for next week. All right, so hopefully. Definitely next week before Thursday, I have to have that done. Because obviously Friday being expiration day, um, we want to know what kind of moves we're going to make. And we always have to make the moves in the butterfly portfolio anyway. So I don't have to be on TV Monday. That means I've got a good full week without any problems. So I will early next week get all this stuff done. We'll do all our portfolio reviews. And then we'll, then we'll decide what to do. But, but again, there's no pressure. You know, that's the thing. If there's nothing, if there's no reason to do it, why do it? You know, you don't 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 make don't spend money for the sake of it. Do not take money out of your pocket if you don't have to. So if you're not getting a better position, if you're not improving your chances of success, if you're not and if you don't have to save something, don't spend the money. You never know when you're going to want to use that money for something useful. Okay. Um, Sorry about that. The UNG was not dumped. It was my mistake. I just can't do the alphabet. <laughs> All right, Sonic. Um, you're cheating. I think that all these positions were not ready yet. Okay, Sonic. Um, oh, yeah. Didn't work out that well. It worked out well because we got a very cheap spread. We only paid like 20 something cents for the spread. So that was fine. And we're going to be a buck 50 in the money. So we're just going to end up cashing it. Basically, the 22 puts are out of the money, so they expire. What? Wait, wait, wait. Oh, because they're June. The 22 puts are going to expire worthless. We're going to cash the bull call spread. I don't know that we want to stick with it. I like Sonic, but obviously that whole fast food sector is uh, not out of favor at the moment. See, and again, we could, we could, have, we could have gotten out earlier and taken some money, but we didn't. So they're kind of back to where I like them as a long term. So I'm, you know, I have to look at this. I, first of all, Sonic goes back on the watch list, if, if nothing else. But I mean, you know we have a watch list, right? That's really important for the members. You have a watch list, and you can get to it by simply going to um, the, the portfolio tab. Yeah, here. And it's right there. Okay. So we go and, and on the watch list we've got um, 21 stocks. Sonic should be one of them, but well, it's not one of them because it was in a portfolio. So it's not, you know we don't put things generally that are in a portfolio on the watch list. But it's a good one to add to the watch list because I do like them. They are much better than average fast food place, and they're just beat up with everybody else. But they're a good, but it's a good little company. Yeah, too much blue. Hey, <laughs> you're right. No, no, no blue manager. I'm in withdrawal today. That's the problem. And I'm not going to buy another one. I already told my daughter that. I'm like, not buying another one for another thirty-five. I'm not going to have a thirty-five dollar a week blue mountain coffee habit. That's not going to happen. <laughs> do you think? The, do you think this has? You know, it's funny because it's all in perspective, though. Because honestly, I do have a five dollar uh, every time I pass a Starbucks cascara latte thing. I love those. Um, so I ended up spending five bucks, like probably spent thirty-five dollars a week on cash on lattes when I go buy the Starbucks. Um, and you go buy Starbucks a lot. 
<laughs> especially in my town. Um, so, so it's all a matter of perspective. I think that's part of it. They get you, they get you used to like thinking how much coffee's worth. I'm like, well, I paid five bucks a cup anyway. So, what's the difference if I buy a thirty-five dollar bag and it's, you know, like twenty or thirty cups of coffee? Do you think the Fed raises rates next week on Wednesday? Absolutely. I've been saying that forever. I'm the, I'm the first guy that ever told people that. I, I, I did not see any possible logical way they couldn't raise rates on 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 uh, Wednesday next week. It just it, it backs them into too much of a corner not to. And and everything about the economy is pointing to saying probably this is a good idea. You have UNG and the OOP. Yep, we got that. And Sonic earnings are April first. Okay. Well, I do expect them to be good. Um, we're going to be out of the trade, but I think. Well, you know what? Then I think I think we probably would just keep the short puts and then maybe see how the earnings look and then go for a, a 2019 um, spread. And yes, Mike, thank you. I will do the oil report. That's good timing. Um, petroleum. That's what's called. Petroleum. Petroleum. Now let's see what the hell happened. Make it bigger. Make it bigly. All right. Oh, you bastards. Look at the net imports. Last week, 7.3 million barrels a day. Now 6.9 million barrels a day. They imported 400,000 less barrels per day. That is 2.8 million barrels for the week less import. That is a huge change. Now, I wouldn't as it's possible. Now, this could possibly be uh, a result of the OPEC oil that's, that's being lessened, or for whatever reason, but I just think they're being dickheads. Um, look, a little bit of oil escapes from the FPR too. That's interesting. We got. Um, 500,000 barrels left the SPR. I think they're starting to get rid of that oil. They promised they were going to sell out of the SPR. Um, the big change here: gasoline had a big had a good drawer, like six million barrel draw. Oil had a huge build, eight million barrel build in oil. But that's really surprising. Though. That's just a shocking change in import. Um, and obviously, so uh, let's see. Now, here's the question. See, now, you, you talk about gasoline, this drawing gasoline or whatever. It's the same amount of gasoline we had last week. They supplied the same amount. They supplied more distillates. All other oils they supplied less of. So they're drawing all other oils, a little bit of the drawing all other oils. So on the whole, oh, here's the input to refineries is the same. So refinery output, product supplied, was the same. Input to refineries was essentially the same. Gasoline production, essentially the same. Yet we had a, a bigger draw in gasoline this week. Gasoline was down $5 million. Now, was that demand or was it something else? And it's very hard to say because when you look at $5 million, it's only two days worth of exports. We export Five million every two days of gasoline and other petroleum products. So we refine, you know, we take the oil in here, refine it, and then we sell it to people who need to run their cars. So we have way, way more refining capacity than South America does. So the easy, and, and also, you know, we have to send we have to send oil to like other other like the Philippines and things like that. So a lot of people buy our oil that's refined for gasoline. So I don't, you know, there's nothing jumping out of me in this report that says anything other than the fact that obviously, if we report, if we imported 2. Um, 400, if we imported 2.8 million less barrels of oil last week, that that by itself pretty much offsets the building gasoline. So it's hard to say. Uh, you know, we always we're always exporting a lot, and look at how much we're exporting. I mean, we're exporting two and a half million barrels. That's out of out of 19 million barrels supplied, 2.5 million barrels. That is uh, 10, uh, 12 percent or something like that. So 12 percent of the oil that we produce 
is exported. So the U.S. demand is actually 12% lower than you think it is. So that, that's why, and, and so that, that's why when you look at this report, you look at that, and then you say, well, okay, now it makes sense that that oil dropped like that, because this is very, very, not at all painting a good demand picture. Where is it? Oh, it's not even on here. Oh, see, back up a bit. All right. So that's there. <laughs> it's pretty nasty, though. And um, I take a look at gasoline. If, if I'm going to pick a winner, I pick gasoline to hold. Oh, I wish it went lower. I, I said earlier that 165 starts getting attractive to play for the bounce. I would wait for tomorrow, though, because this looks nasty. He, did, he had no respect at all for his support here. So gasoline is holding support. But if oil goes down to 50, this guy could break down another all the way to 160. Now, at 160, I'm going to be loving gasoline long. But, but right now, I, I, this is bad. So I would not be inclined to play today. I would, be, I would certainly want to wait for tomorrow. We do like to go long into the weekends. It's always fun. You can always, you know, almost always there's going to be some kind of bounce. But let it stabilize. There's no reason to rush into the trade. That is an interesting thing, though. Okay. Energy independent. Well, you know, look, we are energy independent. We, we don't need these guys. We're importing. No, we're not importing. I'm sorry. Let's get back to that thing. We only import 6.9 million barrels of oil. So the rest we produce in, the, in, the, in this country. So we're supplying the refineries with 15 million barrels. Okay, crude oil input to refineries, 15 million barrels, of which 9 million barrels are coming from domestic sources that we're producing our own oil. 6.9 million barrels, 7 million barrels are being produced outside and we're importing it on ships, right? Now, of that, okay, first of all, of that, we're shipping 2.5 million of it right back. So we don't actually need Two and a half million of the seven million in inputs. We just would say to the other countries, "Sorry, we're not, you know we don't have any extra oil." It's very easy to do that. So we could be you know that that right there means that it's not seven million; it's four point five million of imports that we need. We absolutely, absolutely get four point five million barrels of oil from Mexico and Canada. We get we probably get a half a million barrels or, or no no more than a million, probably a half a million barrels of oil from OPEC in the first place. Our oil comes from Mexico and Canada and Venezuela. Venezuela has and, and Brazil. So Brazil, Venezuela, Mexico, Canada, they give us all they give us all the oil we could possibly want. And we're not going to war with any of those guys. Uh, maybe Mexico. <laughs> they should do that, man. They should they should just like put a tax on the oil. They say, okay, you build a wall, you want us to pay for it, we'll charge you ten dollars a barrel extra for gas that you buy. For oil that you buy. See how that goes over. But we're not, you know, we're, we're not needing any foreign oil. We are energy. We're energy independent in the Americas, put it that way. So the Americas are energy independent. We don't actually need oil from any other continent. And, and, and as we increase, so half, look, half of the oil that we have, Goes to so goes to gas. As cars get more efficient, okay, cars will eventually get on the average sixty to one hundred miles a gallon. So we'll need half that much oil from from gasoline. Distillate, same thing, but not not so drastic. We'll probably need a million less there, and then all other products that that that's your pretty steady need. I mean that's that's the stuff they make out of oil, like plastic and stuff. Um, and also specialty liquids, lubrication, things like that. Those are things that are not going to change. But probably almost half of the oil that we use will eventually go away. And, um, 
and that will leave a tremendous flood of oil globally. And it won't be just us. It's going to be every country. It's going to be cutting down 20, 30, 40, 50 percent over the next decade. Uh, eventually, they'll be down 50 percent. Maybe in 20 years, everybody will be using like half as much oil as they use now. You'll never see this much oil used again. This is peak demand for oil. There we are now. Um, and that's very bad because uh, generally, there's roughly at the current level of demand, there's already 40 years worth of oil that's been discovered and in reserve. So the anticipation of it is, uh, you know, at, at the world using uh, uh, 90 million barrels a day, let's see, you've got 90 million barrels a day, math is so hard, 90 million barrels a day times 365 days times 32 billion times 40 years, 1.3 trillion barrels of oil, that's how much oil is laying around. <clears throat> in reserves and in different places. So 1.3 trillion barrels of oil. Most of that oil is either in the hands of the Saudis or Venezuela. That's probably more than half of that oil is in those two places, in Saudi Arabia and Venezuela. Um, now the problem is, for them, that we're never going to use it. They want to sell it to us. Now, forget discovering more oil. That's off the table. Nobody, that, that doesn't really need to be done. The, the oil they have now, because that's at 40 years, that's a demand. But in 20 years, we'll be using half. So that means in 20 years, they'll still have 40 years left. That's without finding any more oil and without any alternatives being discovered for distillates or other products in 40 years. That's just not even realistic. So things happen <laughs> over time, and you stop using stuff like, like, like whale oil, right? Like it used to be like you had to have whale oil for everything. We don't have we don't use whale oil now. But back 100 years ago, everybody was saying, oh, my God, you always need whale oil. What do we do when we run out of whale? And, and lo and behold, we did run out of whale, so they kept using it for oil. Um, now we have regular oil, and now everybody says, oh, my God, well, we're always going to need regular oil. No, we won't. Okay, they will, they believe me, they're going to be printing hydrocarbons. Every, you know, we're, we're, we're carbon-based life form. We're, we're, our main ingredient is carbon, aside from water. So we're carbon-based life form. Um, everything in the world is basically carbon. Oil is just a string of carbons also, and um, obviously some other chemicals, but basically carbon. And... Over the course of the next 50 years, believe me, you will have, it will be like Star Trek. They're going to have like 3D printers will be to the point where they can make any material you want. You don't need to drill for oil. You just sort of put it in, you know, come out of your little printer, printer dispenser sort of thing. Um, so so we're, we're never going to use all the oil that's there now. So the problem is, this is why the Saudis talk about market share all the time. The problem is, Who's going to sell the most oil they can before it all becomes essentially worthless? And it's just like coal. Okay, coal used to be the primary source of energy in this country. A hundred years ago, coal was it. Oil was just starting to come around, and and then suddenly it became it, it outpaced the oil coal. Coal is still pretty big; it has a long legacy, but the amount of coal that's in the ground is never going to get all used. And that's become, it's taken decades for that to play out. But as it plays out, it's true. Something no one in 100 years ago ever could have imagined is completely true now. The coal that we've discovered, all these companies that have these fantastic coal reserves, all the money that's changed hands, betting on coal's future and so on and so forth, all evaporating up in smoke as all these people are just sitting on giant, worthless coal mines everywhere. And that's what's going to happen. As hard as it is to see it clearly, that's what's going to happen with the oil too. That all this oil is just going to sit in the ground and it won't even be worth extracting. So the Saudis are looking at, let's say they've got 400 billion barrels of oil. So the Saudis are thinking, well, 400 billion barrels of oil at $50 a barrel at least 
is worth two trillion dollars. For sure, right? If sure it's worth two trillion, but they're trying to get a one trillion dollar valuation for Saudi Aramco oil, which controls most of that oil. They're not going to get that. When they go public, you'll see. In fact, there'll be a lot of studies. What I'm saying right now is going to be studied very carefully in valuing Saudi Aramco. And, and the Saudis are not going to like the results. So it's going to lay bare something that, that nobody's really talking about. The fact that it's not that great of an asset. And investors are not going to see their way clearly to getting a $1 trillion valuation back from that company because they are ultimately going to eat half of that oil. It's just going to sit there and lay in the ground and, and have, you know, there'll be specialty uses and things like that, but not enough to create the demand that's going to make it uh, a valuable commodity. For them. So, so that's why they've all been pumping like crazy and producing like crazy. They, they know that. They know that they've got the next 10 years to really sell a huge amount of oil, and after that it's going to start tapering off tremendously. But we are we are now at peak demand. So why the rush? Produce, so that's one thing. The rush to produce more is because you've got a, you've got a, you've got a basement full of oil, and you've got to sell it before it's just a basically a basement you've got to clean up. That's all they got. They got a country full of oil, and they got to get rid of it and turn it into something valuable. And that's why, by the way, the Saudis like. They, they, they flip their whole investment fund over to start investing in other stuff. They've got to figure out what they're going to do with themselves. And, and the funny thing about the Saudis, the Saudi Arabia is kind of like a family business. It's not a country. It's a family business. I mean, because everybody in that country, everything is run by the royal family. The royal family owns everything. And they've got um, a couple of thousand uh, direct relatives, princes to support, basically. All these, you know, you know, Saudi sheiks and Saudi princes, right? They all get these stipends from, from the government. They think, but, they, but the government isn't the government. The government is just their, their uncle, basically. And so these guys are doling out cash. So it's a big family corporation that takes care of the family business, which is producing oil, and they've got 2,000 families to feed directly in the royal family that all live these incredibly lavish lifestyles that they have to support. So it's kind of like Congress. <laughs> Frankly, it's like that. Um, so these guys are looking down the road and saying, this business plan doesn't work. We can't keep getting, we can't, we don't have the money to keep doing this. So they have to figure out something besides the oil business that's going to make money. They are desperate to start some kind of new ventures that make money. And they are all over the planet just doing, they're, they're, they're putting their hands into everything, just trying to get on top of a situation that they know is going to kick their, kick their asses in 20 years. It's very interesting to see them scrambling. And that's why they're selling off Saudi Aramco. That's why they're taking... They, Saudi Aramco is their baby. That's the whole family fortune. And by taking it public, they're going to take a couple of hundred billion dollars in in exchange for, part, in exchange for their future. But, but they know that that future is no longer real and they've got to start taking that 200 billion and putting it to work so that they can feed themselves. It's really weird. It's like a, it's a very intense situation going on over there. It's a whole country has to completely change their ways, and, and they have very limited time to do it. Would I poke long wall at 50? Absolutely. I'd play 54 bounce in oil. Are we there yet? Oh, 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 God, yeah. Holy shit. Poor oil. Wow, you almost feel bad for them, right? Oh, and that's going to, that's gonna, oh, look at, my, look at my money. My money's coming back. I shouldn't have, ah, see, now I feel bad that I sold this. So we're gonna so we're gonna have a nice dip here. Everything should be good. If we go below fifty, that's gonna really knock the Dow down. Any news or is this just happening for no reason? Um Bill, post it on the blog. Your prices on APO seem off. I don't see the bill prices. Okay, well let's deal with that when I get back, okay? Um I, I mean I I think I said what I, I I might have looked at the wrong thing, so I have to go over the whole comment. I don't have any index shorts you like in here. Yeah, we just on Friday, we put up those TZAs, man. They're still playable. Um, it was Friday, right? Wow, Friday was so long ago. There it is. 
I'm telling you, man, I did, I've done so much stuff since Friday. It seems like a lifetime ago. Where are we? There it is. Okay. October 15th with four bucks. October 23th with two bucks. Let's see how that's holding up. TZA. October 14th. Ooh, they shot up, huh? Now they're five bucks. Wow. That really zoomed up. So they're like 530. And what were the other ones? Ah, my memory is like 10 seconds and that's it. October 23. Um, and the 23s are $2 or 210. So what do we say? Five. Um, is it 15 23s? 15s. So the 15s, oh no, they're not so bad. What are we talking about? 475. Oh, that's better. The 15s are 475. And the 23s are 210, so your net there is uh, 265, and the net was two dollars, so it's gone up 65 cents. But still, that's not bad. 265 on an eight dollar spread, and and the 15s are 377 in the money. So the only way you lose is if the Russell goes lower. I'm sorry. If, I'm sorry. If the Russell goes higher, TCA goes lower. So you can't lose anything unless the Russell goes higher than it is now. So if you're hedging, that's the best way to hedge, right? You can only lose your hedging money if the index, which is all your longs that you're protecting, goes up. So meanwhile, you have the 15s. You're 378 in the money, and you're only paying. Let's make sure we have the numbers right again. You're paying 475 minus 210. Is 265. So you're paying 265 to be 375 in the money. That's a great deal just by itself, and that spread can return eight dollars to you. So that's like a 300% profit if it go if the Russell goes down. So you can make 300% back, and that. Then, as an offset, though, I like selling. I said you can buy 30 of those. And six thousand dollars. You can offset half the cost by selling some sixty dollar puts GILD for five bucks. Let's see how those are doing. It doesn't have to be Gilead. It could be anything you would want to buy if it got cheaper. But in this case, Gilead, the sixty dollar what? It wasn't sixty dollar puts. Look at that. So, oh, so so you're in luck on the spread because the sixty dollar puts got much more expensive. The sixty dollar puts are now um, six sixty. So you can sell five of the 660s to $6,300, and you can buy 30 of the spreads for, I don't know, maybe uh, about $3,200. So you're gonna be, it'll, be, it'll work out about the same net. Your net is $3,000, and your upside potential, if you hit this, you have eight times 30, is $24,000 back. So $21,000 potential profit on this spread. That's seven times back on your money. So if you take just five, you know, if you protect just five percent of your portfolio, you're going to get thirty-five percent back. So that's a, this is a very, very good hedge. It's certainly the hedge I like the best right now, still. I hope that was clear. You said which afterwards. Um, Charles. What are we doing? Trade. Dave, how are we doing? Ah, yes. Oh. Damn it, I screwed myself out of like 4000 bucks. Oh, well. <laughs> Just teaching how to play properly, so therefore I tell you, I, I, I raised my basis, and so my net now is going to be uh, up about 4000 Like I said, I'm going for the big one, so we're going to wait and see how far it goes there. So do we want to go, remember, remember I said about gasoline? That's what happened. It broke through, right? Because when you, you, you got to think oil. If oil is going down horrifically, why would gasoline not follow it? Because it's all very, very ugly, though. Much worse than I thought it was going to be. Oh, so meanwhile, I was kicking myself for not getting out here last time, right? Getting completely out of the down trade. So now I kind of want to find out why are we down. So what time is it? Two thirty. Okay, let's take a look at some news. Let's take a minute to take a look at the news. 
Because I don't know what happened that they made the market do this. Welcome, you guys are not watching my news. Top news, all news. Hmm. Starbucks loses restaurant traffic market share. Speaking of Starbucks, right? Starbucks nailed down 11% restaurant traffic during the month, down from 12% in January. Blah, blah, blah. A lot of, lot of um, what do they mean, restaurant traffic? I'm not sure. They're not really restaurants, so it's not fair. Delta creates Alienware, gaming toy. Oh, okay. See, Best Buy, I love what Best Buy does. They, they get all these manufacturers to rent space in their store to show off their product. Really working well for them, too. Oh, I didn't know Alienware was separate from Dell. That's interesting. Okay. EVMT. I never look at them separately. People, the kids, man, I told them my daughter, forget it. They, it either has to be, either you got to make it yourself or you go with Alienware. They don't trust anything else. They will not buy a Dell. And Dell knows this. That's why they bought Alien. Um, they, you know, the gamers will, they, 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 it's interesting because you would think people don't build PCs themselves anymore, but they do. Because these kids are not satisfied with anything but the super duper state of the art. So they're still sitting there in their basements, just like we used to do when we were kids. And they're, they're, they're putting together like the, the drives and the cars and the fits and the co-processors. They're doing everything they can to soup up those machines so that they have, they actually perceive there's an advantage, especially in these player on player games. Having a better machine actually gives you an edge. And uh, it just becomes more and more important as they get the, um, the, the, the virtual reality and stuff like that, which takes massive processing power. You know, you don't want to be glitching while you're shooting at somebody, right? Uh, oil tumbles more than 4% after the inventory report. Um, uh, Bloomberg takes no 220,000 trade on the fund today. Uh, nothing. Okay, who cares? All right. Microsoft hyperscale joke. There you go. A hyperscale GPU accelerator. That's for the cloud stuff, though. But they, they need it, too. Everybody wants this power, power, power all of a sudden. Occidental advance. Oh my God! What was what was dividends they say now? Wow, dude! Scientific games, games all licensing. Really? Amex updates to look at investor day. Salesforce reissued in '95. There's nothing really earth shaking going on here. Only prepared. Did somebody just realize Trump was president? Is that what happened? <laughs> Scared the shit out of me. City raising on FedEx. Gas prom, what gas prom do? Um, so bonds. Now this is going all the way back to where I last looked at it. Ah, what's wrong in retail? Maybe more than you think. Target guys, this border tax here, so that's Trump's fault. Price number of chains, uh, e commerce players cruising right along. So they're saying that even though you have all these problems in retail, you got a lot of people who've made all, you know, like, like a lot of these retailers are up tremendously, even though you think they have a lot of headwinds. So we'll see. We'll see if it lasts. Jeffries issues IBM underperform. Yeah. Okay. Citing so fundamentals, absence of financial metrics involving otherwise apparently interesting areas. So yes, Watson, it's a very slow burn. Get over it. Blockchain, even slower burn. Quantum computing. These are three things that are going to take years to develop. Oh, my God. Jeez. So impatient. That guy, that one made sense. He raised his target to 215. I love IBM, but they're, they're still a little bit high in the range for buying. North American shale production is early and ramping up more than planned. ETF shares record low. Oh, just an ETF, not ETFs in general. <laughs> Netflix is doing movies. Oh, boy, that's the way. Oh, yeah. Netflix is like, boy, we, we, have, we can't go bankrupt fast enough. What can we <laughs> Let's make some movies. It's such a safe business, right, making movies. Um, unbelievable. Lack of insight of buying a Buffalo Wild Wings. It's freaking... $25 for a bucket of wings is crazy. 
I, I was in the city. I spent $25. I don't think I had 10 wings. I was so mad. Analysts compared Caterpillar counting loads to form a high flying reason. Oh, that's not good. Isn't that bad? May you see the beginning of their accounting worm type I, I got to read up on this because I don't know what's going on exactly with Caterpillar, but obviously they got a lot of trouble here right now. Samsung. Okay, nothing. So they, there's no particular reason for this sell off other than we're basically going back to where we were before, which is, you know, it's what I said this morning. Oh, here you go. So it is holding. I'm, I'm gonna, so I'm going to do what I should have done $100 times. I'm going to take the money on the Dow. I know it's annoying when you have to do it one at a time, right? <laughs> but you know what? While I'm doing this, if it, like, popped up on me, I'd just leave them and be like, okay, fine. If I can't get my price, then I don't want it. Come on. Mm -hmm. and Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm out of this line. I know it could go lower, but I don't care. I mean, if it goes to 2850, I assume it'll bounce back up anyway. Um, not bullish, but it was a nice profit, so I'm taking it off the table. That's all. Um, I'm looking to go long on gasoline. I'm looking to go long on oil, but I, I don't have any particular reason to do it right now. And I want to see what happens with these indexes. Okay, now, if the Dow fails on me, I'm going to look for a fresh horse. So who looks like a fresh horse now? Who has fallen the least? The NASDAQ, obviously, has fallen the least so far. The S&P has fallen. And you can tell by these lines, the S&P has fallen less than the Dow. So if I was going to play for a catch-up, I'd look for the S&P to catch up. But knowing the way the market is and seeing that there's no particular catalyst for the sell-off, I think... We'll do what we always do, which is bounce off, of, off the lows. And if we don't, then maybe it's a new paradigm, but let's take a look at what happens. Um, but if we do what we've done every other day, is we'll bounce back, there'll be a little rally into the close, and then I'll start shorting again. So my goal is to get back to 10, at least 10 shorts on the Dow, but hopefully this time for change, I can skip the 50-point uh, run after I do it. Man, oil... Super duper tempting. If you at 5005, I'd be a buyer right here. I mean, you got you know with it with a stop at 49.95. But I mean, I want a tight stop. But I also I, I think that from 50, when you fall from 50, I mean we're up here. When you fall from 52.50 to 50, that's a two dollars and fifty cent drop. If you get a bounce off of that, even a weak bounce is going to be fifty cents. That's five hundred dollars a contract. It's very, very likely that you're going to get at least a week down. It would be almost unheard of not to get a 25-cent down. So we already had a 25-cent down because that's um, here's the low at 505, and we just hit um, we hit 53.30. So that it did weak bounce off the spike, but I'm I'm talking about non-spikes. So on non-spikes, I would expect that from 52.50 which would actually go from higher than there to 50, that there's a very high probability you'll see 50-50 again before it breaks below 50. And so that makes it a good trade. And we know 50 is significant support for oil, and we know that a 5.5% drop is very unusual. So lots of good reasons to play it long, other than strong dollar, not good, and other than we have no idea why it fell in the first place. That's the interesting part. Why, why, why did everything turn sour right about here? What time, what time was all this happening? It's like, um, it's about 1230. Things really, I mean, for oil, it fell off the cliff, at, you know, after inventory. But I, maybe oil just dragged the rest of the market down. And then, so if oil dragged the rest of the market down, maybe if it hangs on to 50 and bounces, the rest of the market will bounce too. Don't know. Don't oh, know, not playing, so it's fine with me. Okay, so I just got my, I, I, I got out of my coffee. I still have a silver long. I still have my natural gas long. Natural gas, so I'm hoping, remember, not that, there's an NQ. Natural gas, I'm hoping it comes back down here before it goes back up. I don't really want it to go back up. I just don't want to miss it. Okay, wait, do I have an NQ long? I think I do. 
Oh no, BV. Into V7. I do, I have two. Okay, so I have two natural gas longs. I want 310. So even though I'm at 315, I would like to see in 310 where I'll be down 2,500 bucks, and then I'd like to go to four. That's my goal on natural gas. But if it went up, I don't want to miss it. That's what my logic is. I don't want to miss it going up. I have complete faith it'll be at four eventually. So, I, so either way, I'm not going to worry about a short-term loss on these guys. I'm waiting until the next move to four, and I want to have a few contracts in place when it happens. So now with, with gasoline, if it goes back over 165, you can play the momentum above 165 with a very tight stop below it. Oil, though, you don't really have a lot of uh, support until um, until you get to the 50 line. So probably we're going to dribble along with the 50 line, but hopefully it'll consolidate and move back up. Well, hopefully. I, mean, I, I really, I don't, I, hopefully if you want to play along. I mean, I really care less what happens to oil. It will die for all I care. You can choke on that stuff. Cumulative effect of Trump tweets and the overworking. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm <laughs> something is going to crash this market. And there's so many things that could crash this market that you have to play for a crash. You know, we at least have the hedges. And that's why we, that's why last week we pushed guys. I mean, yeah, you, you missed it on the webinar last week. On, on Thursday and Friday last week, we pushed all of our hedges. We're like, we are, if anything, bearish on the market at the moment in our portfolios. We have more hedges than we do long. Because we are anticipating a pretty good sell-off, and and you know I'd say I'd say at least ten percent in the near future. You think no news outlets know they are not selling? <laughs> a friend of mine who works at IBM says, other than Watson, the company's sucking in. I agree. Um, I I think IBM. Look, they've got their service business. Um. It's not going to go away. People trust IBM. If you've got giant prod, you know, no one gets fired for using IBM as their, you know, to do their services and such. So they've got that going for them. They, you know, they, they have, they, they're going to get their, their share of deals. Um, but it isn't just Watson. It's Watson and the quantum computing and the uh, 3D chip technology and stuff like that. The stuff they're working on at Armonk is big. So, you know, as a, as a long-term futury sort of thing, I like IBM for the very long term. Short term, no, they're not, you know, there's, there's no huge return of money that's coming soon. But, but I like them for a long-term investment, basically. And, and by the way, and, and, and if there was nothing but Watson, they'd still make a fortune. That thing's going to take over the universe unless somebody comes up with something spectacularly better, which I doubt. Not in, not in the short term, anyway. Yeah, oil may be the catalyst for the whole sell-off. Like oil drops and then the whole uh, financial, I mean, the um, energy sector drops and the financial fall, the energy sector down. You know, so that, that could be why the whole thing happened in the first place, just the oil drop. But that oil drop is really, you know, I mean, the, it's so funny. We've had much bigger bills in, in, pre, in previous months. And, you know, we've, last week was the only week we didn't have a bill. We had a, week, a build after build after build of inventory, and there was basically no reaction. All of a sudden, there's a big reaction. OPEC headlines, UAE achieves 105% of oil cuts. We knew that. I don't think that's news. Um, I see on 20 USO puts from 50. Oh, fantastic. Well, take the money, man. At least, at least cash half. Don't be too greedy. That's really nice. EBBJ. Okay. <laughs> Are you expecting to sell up before the March contracts roll over? No. Am I expecting to sell up in the next, in the next seven days? I, I, you know, I just think there's an inevitable sell-off, and there's so many different ways it can happen. But when I don't know, it could be it could be weeks, it could be it could be a few months. But I, I just will be amazed if we make it to the summer without a significant sell-off. You know, most of our, most of our contracts are aimed towards June or June, July, and then we've got October, and we have January. But that's, that's you know that's how we're sort of layering in those those hedges. I wouldn't bet one month. I'm gonna, I wouldn't want to have something firing that I think is one month going to happen. Or one, especially one week. Anik headline, UAE minister will exceed mandated oil cuts in March and April. 
Yeah, that, that's because the bullshit he said yesterday didn't work. You know, yesterday they tried to boost the markets, and he talked about how well they were hitting compliance numbers and blah, 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 and that didn't work. Then he made a big mistake because he said, I don't like the way that non-OPEC people like America are stealing our market share because we cut back and they're adding reduction. But he underlines the whole problem. They cut back, and then, and then the shale guys jump right in and start producing more to, to fill in the gap. That's, I mean, it's basic economics. That's why the whole OPEC thing is bullshit. I've been saying that for how long, right? It's bullshit. There was no reason oil ever should have gone back over $55 or even close to $55 because what the Arabs did was nothing. And I said that to the Reuters guy yesterday. I don't know what this uh, I, I doubt he probably wrote half of what I said, but let's see. Bill David. Twenty two hours ago, here you go. Let's see what I said to him. I don't said right. Um oh there you go. OPEC has unrealistic expectation as to what the production cuts can achieve, said Phil Day. Um action over the next slide. Uh, EIA, uh, what? EIS oil production would rise to an average of, okay, 97 million barrels, which, if correct, would top the current record of 9.6 million barrels. That's true. Uh, fund managers have doubled their net longs, which doesn't I mean, see, when you follow these people, they're just as stupid as anybody else. Okay? I know these guys. Okay? When you, when you have, and you talk to them, you realize they, they really aren't any smarter than like your uncle who has a trucking company about like the beef price of you. That's your little thing that they know. But it doesn't make them smart people. It doesn't mean they know more than anybody else. And they'll ask things based on the same and, and all these people who Who's gone and saying that the mistake is doing enough to offset the global macro trends that are driving the price of oil low? By just doing a minor production cutback, they need to do a major. They need to cut production. They didn't do that. Failing to do that was a critical mistake. And do it. They don't have the spines to do it. And that's because also though because economic um, flexibility. You do it. They need to run there and they can like us just deciding to cut everybody's in business. It would freak out the country and plan. That is ninety percent of their of the government's income is oil revenue. You can't afford to cut nine your 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 nine percent. And that's that is in and that's why they are desperately Desperately going to sell off the Aramco, the oil company. Billion dollar valuation, and they're lucky to get a five hundred billion dollar valuation. It'll be probably five hundred. It'll be somewhere, somewhere maybe five to seven. That would be you know better than Exxon, an Apple, a little bit bigger than Apple, but. Not, not not a true like quite a bit. Although, and then, and then the now the interesting thing about that then is what are the Arabs going to do with um, you know a hundred two cash? What are they going to do? What are they going to buy? So that's where the speculation will they buy commercial real estate? They solar farm um, will they start developing infrastructure? It's hard to have money. The money, they can't gamble with it. That's still their future. They've sold the thing that right that makes them all their sell a piece of it right now to pick up some cash in their pocket to running because they're running at a moment. They have to keep the government running and they have to 
figure out what they're going to put their money into that's going to make them as much money for the next 100 years. And that's cool. Very interesting. Let's see a lot of interesting stuff happening in the future. All right, we're going to wrap this thing up. Everything seems to have stabilized. I'm very glad that I took the money and ran on that one. Sure, is I want to get back to like about 920 line. Fifty line. We pray we get to nine fifty. Nine thirty-five. Is that nine thirty-five? Yep, nine thirty-five. So an average nine thirty-five. If I go to twenty, I would be feeling twenty short. Oil. Very very close to nine. There's a big big. Live. I don't know if it. I, I don't know if it was a lower than higher. I think I'd rather sleep. I didn't sleep on it. I wouldn't feel comfortable not knowing what it's going to. Be. But I think. Um, I mean, clearly, what the Saudi guy said isn't working. People will start making real power to do anything about the oil market. And if and if that really really coming the story that they that they don't have the power to keep oil, you can go back to forty. I wouldn't don't know what's going to happen, so I'd wait. Other fun things to play, like silver. I don't know why. I don't know why with the dollar is plowing up to 102 something. We already know. It's not so. If that's what's beating down gold and silver, and clearly it is. Look, here's the dollar going up. Here's gold going down. Here's silver going down. So that makes this a great long. And gold too. Gold off the twelve hundred line. That's a great long. Better, in fact, that's a better long than silver. Off the we can go back down to sixteen fifty pretty easily. Which I, I would love. And I, I like my I got my I got my. I don't, I'm not playing gold. I'm playing silver. I'm still even play both. Um, I want to get like to pick up a long on this if it can stand to fifty to the fifty line. Gasoline, I guess. If you want to even them up, there, I mean, you want to see gasoline down around here, 62. See what happens tomorrow. I'm not going to jump into that trade at all. And now we'll wait and see how much of a bounce they manage to get out of these indexes. Don't. Um, is from. We know 950 is where it's been holding. So 209, 950 to 20 points. That's nothing. So you're going, to, you're going to get a bounce, which is going to be uh, 95. Oh, wait. Sorry, 950, 80 is 70 points. Yeah, it's nothing. It's nothing. So a weak bounce is 50, 95 is a weak bounce. And um, 9, 9, and then 9, 10. 9, 10. Strong bounce. Strong bounce. So if it's, and they come back below this green line, they're probably going to head down lower. And we'll see what happens. But right now, we're having the normal generic rally almost always happen. So it's going to be fun. We've got a lot of fun plays to make tomorrow. I'm excited. I like this. The market is getting interesting. What's, he, what's his latest wrong thing that he's um, are you expecting to sell off? Okay. He truly cruises uh, like the <laughs> Yeah, he is the best. He's, uh, there's nothing like a reliable. Hey, hey, as long as he's reliable, he can be reliably wrong. As long as he's reliable, that means you can call him and play him. He is reliably wrong. All right. All right, guys. So we've had and we will uh, wrap it up. And uh, we have our marching looking to go long on oil. We're looking to go long on gasoline, but not up here. I'd rather go long on 50 is a better floor than long on gas here. We're already long on silver. That's 70. And we want to get back long on coffee. It's at 41.75 now. It goes back to buying it again. 
And on the indexes, I'm dying to get back on the shorts, but we're going to wait and see what kind of bounce we get. Getting at least, I would say, nine ten. Nine pounds. That's about as high as we're going to end up going. So about there is when I'm going to start buying more puts. Maybe wrong. I could comfortable some at nine ten and some at nine fifty, and that's going to average um, nine thirty. Because nine thirty is, is right there. I don't mind. I don't mind having at least uh, about ten long with the nine thirty average. Twenty again. A lot of faith in this market's going to tank. I don't know when. I just think it's going to be a nice payoff down the road. The market said between now and July, i got to figure out how to make enough money to buy a car. That's my goal. <laughs> so you can have a like goal for what you want to buy. Keep track of your winnings. That's why when you make $1,500 in five minutes like we did on the coffee trade, you take it off the table. That's good money. That's a deposit. All right, guys. Thanks for stopping by. We will do it again next Cocktails. Great solution or suggestion.